Welcome, Wargamers. Doug here from 2 Plus Stuff, and today we are exploring the Path to Glory section of the Fire Slayers Battle Tome that just dropped. Now, if you're looking for information about the War Scrolls and that kind of stuff, you know, all that stuff's available for you online. I really always recommend the channel uh, Gorilla Miniature Games by Ash Barker. Uh, he does like a literal read through of the entirety of the battle tome. Uh, so if that's what you're interested, you can go check that out there. For me, I'm going to focus on the Path of Glory section, which fundamentally asks the question, how can I tell the story of the Fire Slayers over time? An evolving narrative where they grow, they shrink because they lose, you know, members of their army, that kind of stuff. I think there's a lot of compelling uh, story elements here that are really, I don't know. I just, I just like. They're just very fascinating to me in terms of design. So, we're going to check out the Fire Slayers here, and uh, we'll go to the Downward Cam and take a look. Welcome, Wargamers. Doug here from 2 Plus Stuff, and today we are doing a deep dive into the Path to Glory section of the Fire Slayers Battle Tome, something I am very excited to talk about because, to me, it's probably one of the best in terms of um, the kinds of stories it allows you to tell. You know, not necessarily in terms of... Uh, gameplay or, or balance or anything like that, but what it literally lets you do. It's a very new kind of design idea for these games, and I, I just think it's fascinating. If you're interested in this book or you want anything basically GW, if you wouldn't mind, I have an affiliate link in the description down below for Noble Knight Games. They're a great game store here in the Midwest of the United States. Um, they ship within 24 to 48 hours max, like I've ordered a lot of things from them. Uh, with discounts on all GW stuff, and uh, they're just really easy to work with. Using that link goes a long way to supporting the channel, and I just really appreciate it. So thank you all so much, and let's go to the Downward Camp and check out the Path to Glory. All right, and again, please forgive me for my voice. I'm just getting over a cold, but I was so excited to talk about this book. And if you have not done these with me, uh, basically in these videos, I kind of skip the lore because I do, you know, dedicated lore videos for all things Age of Sigmar. And instead, I jump to the Path to Glory section. Uh, and we are going to talk about the... Let's see. Uh, that'll be good. So we'll go right here. There's a lot of information regarding Allegiance abilities and um, War Scroll updates and stuff like that. The truth is, the Allegiance abilities didn't change very much. Uh, in terms of their overall function, if you're not familiar, um, Fire Slayers... They hammer these runes of Grimnir into their body, and they can channel the energy of their deity like into themselves by doing so. And the way that that manifests itself is basically you can choose one of these superpowers per turn. You can never choose the same one twice, and it gives your army a bonus. Okay, so being uh, mindful of what you know um, effects you need to happen at what stages of the game is key to this. But from a narrative perspective. You're basically just, it's, it's rune management is, is the name of the game here. But when it comes to Path to Glory, which is sort of the in-between each game story arc that's going on for your particular army or warband or whatever, Fire Slayers won, in my opinion. I think it's the best. So here we go. Path to Glory. Um, on page 72, you will find a Magma Hold roster to add to your Path to Glory roster. Where's that? Yeah, so they just give you another sheet to keep track of stuff, which sounds like, oh man, you're burying me in paperwork, but wait for it. This is going to be cool. Vaults of Gold. During your Path to Glory campaign, you will earn gold in a number of ways, such as fulfilling mercenary contracts. Uh, keep a note of how much gold you have in your treasury. Depending on the amount, your warlord may earn bonus renown points in the aftermath sequence of Path of Glory battles, as long as they were included in your army. The amount they receive is listed below. So, let's pause there. Um, if you're not familiar with the Fire Slayers, they have these vaults full of Urgold, which are constantly being melted down to make runes and that kind of stuff. Uh, but the, the pride and power of a rune father to run his magma hold, like his whole army, his society, everything, is measured by how full those vaults are, right? I mean, that's their core religious mission, economic one, everything is just Urgold. So, the more you have in your savings account, uh, the more reputation you gain. And so, this is to kind of do that. If you have 0 to 10,000 gold in your vault, you get 0 bonus renown to 10,001 to 50, uh, 50,000 that is, you get an extra, bon uh, sorry, one extra renown point and uh, anything greater than 50,000 is uh, two, which is really cool because renowned 
it doesn't it doesn't always matter when it comes to heroes but it can on some of those smaller heroes for sure so already we have to keep track of how much you know gold we have in our vaults that's cool very thematic and your rune father would absolutely keep track of that in addition you can spend gold from your treasury in the following ways hold a guz fest uh on the eve of battle you hold a goose fest uh for your warriors Magmalt ale flows freely, this night as war songs sung and sagas recounted, strengthening the will of your warriors for the battle to come. That's incredible. What a great little blurb there. Um, let's see. Before a middle or higher tier battle, meaning uh, you go against an opponent that is equal to or more than you in terms of um, you know territories they've captured and the army size, that kind of stuff, you can choose to build a hold Guzfest. If you do so... Oh, sorry, you can choose to hold one, not build one. <laughs> uh, you must spend 100 gold for each unit in your army. Uh, each unit in your army is treated as having a bravery characteristic of 10 for that battle. Now, um, interesting kind of thing there. This is not your roster. So it's not every unit that you have available to you. It's the units that are in that specific army that you're going against. You've already determined... If someone's a higher tier or equal to you in terms of like their uh, strength of battle kind of a thing. So what this is simply saying is, hey, listen, that army you created for each unit that you did, you can give them all bravery 10, which is really cool. And that's a fantastic ability to bring into something like order. I mean, these guys are a horde army by nature. So bravery 10 is awesome. And given, you know, it depends on how many units you go for. I mean, I, I can compare it to like my Stormcast armies or something like that. I, I mean, it's not very helpful because they're so radically different. But uh, I think it's a, a fantastic use of that gold. The next one is Delve Beneath the Mountains. Th uh, though this puts considerable strain on your treasury, you, find a, you fund an expedition into the mountain below to discover any secrets it might hold. Before making an exploration roll, so this is a post-battle one, uh, on the territories table, you can spend 10,000 gold to fund an expedition. If you do so, do not roll a d66. Instead, roll one dice and add 60 to the roll. Now, this is awesome. If you don't know, the the 61 through 66 uh, territories on in the Path to Glory when you're looking for territories kind of a thing tend to be the best. Um, at least some of the best. You have the choice between using the ones that are in the core book uh, and the ones that it points you to, which are mostly for um, making sure your roster has enough spaces. Um, so like, you know, if you have this territory, you can take an extra wizard or whatever. Well, that does matter specifically for the one that lets you take more heroes because fire slayers. <laughs> they got... They got five whole war scrolls back here and three of them are heroes. That's an exaggeration, but you know what I mean? Like they have an abundance of heroes. So to be able to field them, you're going to need hero slots in your Path to Glory roster. So immediately that has appealed to me right off the bat. Um, Cause now you can make sure that you always have the spaces in your rosters for everything else. In addition, if you don't want to use the book given ones, every single battle tome, comes with their own territories, 61 through 66. So we're going to review these later, but keep in mind, I'm going to revisit this point, you can choose to roll on this set of sixes instead of the D66 kind of a thing. So there's some good uses to that. I mean, that's kind of like a meta game, you know, for the Path to Glory thing in terms of like making sure you have the allocations that you need to be able to fill the list that you want or get the territories that actually are significant to you. But I do like it. So we'll go to the next one here. Forge a mighty artifact. You instruct your Zargrim priesthood to forge an artifact worthy of Saga. After seven days and seven nights spent before the Master Forge, they finally emerge. In step seven of the Aftermath sequence, you can spend 20,000 gold to forge an artifact. If you do so, you can immediately add one artifact of power to your vault. Again, phenomenal thematic. It's expensive. I mean, we'll see how expensive compared to how much you're making each game, but uh, a really neat idea. I love every single one of these because it spreads their options out across. So you have right before a battle, 
in the aftermath sequence. And yes, this this uh, artifact one is also in the aftermath sequence, but realistically, you can get an artifact on demand, right? It doesn't have to happen after a specific battle or anything like that. So I just, I like that a lot. Up here on the top right, mercenary contracts. In step seven of the aftermath sequence, you can choose to generate mercenary contracts for your army and then decide whether or not you will accept it. To generate a mercenary contract, follow these steps. So keep in mind, you're not locked into these things. You can choose yay or nay. It's just that after every game, a contract is offered to you. So determine the paymaster of the contract, determine the quarry, and choose whether or not you'll accept it. Uh, the next thing here is reputation. A Fire Slayer's Path to Glory has a reputation score that affects the types of mercenary contracts it's offered. To begin with, a Fire Slayer's Path to Glory army has a reputation score of zero. During your Path to Glory campaign, reputation modifiers may be applied to your score. As a result, your reputation can be negative as well as positive. Snap. So they choose to use the word reputation. I would have gone with like honor or something like that. Basically, it's the social currency of any given magma hold. What do people think of you? Are you trustworthy? Do you, you know, fulfill your contracts? Do you do stuff? Do you work with others? That kind of thing. Uh, I guess in that sense, reputation is a totally good word. It's just, it gets used a lot in a different game, so I would love to see more words kind of thrown in there. Anyway, the paymaster. The first step is to determine who the paymaster of the mercenary contract is. This is the benefactor who will honor the payment of the contract upon fulfillment. First, determine the paymaster's grand alliance by rolling a 2d6, adding your reputation score to the final result, and consulting the table below. So we have here, let's see here. So I'll show you how this works. Please forgive the uh, Blood Bowl dice here. So we'll roll 2d6, uh, that's a 6, and a 2, that's eight so it would be eight plus um whatever our reputation score is we start at zero so that would be order because order is seven plus next thing then roll twice on the table below consulting the appropriate grand alliance column to give the paymaster the first uh, name and then a title okay so let's do this here uh we rolled order so we'll do a d6 um four five Lord Thomas, the Merchant Prince. I like it. Lord Thomas, the Merchant Prince, is hiring us. And we'll move on here, and we talk about the quarry. Now, the next step is to determine the quarry of the contract by rolling on the table below. Each quarry comes with a reward and a reputation modifier. If the reward requires a dice roll, for example, d6 times 1,000 gold, make the dice roll before deciding whether or not to accept the contract. So you get to know how much you're making before you agree to do it. I like that. Um, but the fact that it's random makes it replayable, right? I mean, I think that's pretty cool. The reputation modifier is not applied to your reputation score until after you have fulfilled the contract and the reward, sorry, and received the reward. So let's do this again here. We got our order column. We'll cover up the rest here. Uh, and we're going to roll a d6, five. Quarry is chaos. The reward is d6 times 1,000 gold and plus two reputation. That sounds like a contract I would take because I'm an order faction. I already want to kill chaos. That's totally fine. And it sounds like good money. Um, accepting the contract. The final uh, step is to decide whether or not you will accept the contract. If you choose not to accept it, you must wait until the aftermath sequence of your next Path to Glory battle before you can generate another. If you choose to accept it, make a note of its details on your Magma Hold roster, like we showed earlier. Uh, a Fire Slayer army can only have one mercenary contract at a time, because they don't break oaths, so they're, they're locked. And I like that quite a bit. Uh, fulfilling the contract, so we'll talk about, you know, our thing was chaos, that's our quarry. Let's talk about how we do this. To fulfill the mercenary contract, your army must win a major victory against an army whose faction belongs to the Grand Alliance listed as the quarry in the contract. Uh, in step seven of the aftermath sequence of that battle, you receive the reward and your reputation score is modified by the specif uh, specified amount. Um, and that would happen, I assume, before you roll for your next contract. So like, if we did this, we would now be at a plus two modifier for our reputation. 
Um, now what's interesting, I want to pause there. We talked about reputation modifiers before, uh, but what's interesting is that working with some of these other factions, um, they get, the, the balance is some of them pay you a lot of money, but they hurt your reputation score. Others help your reputation and don't pay very much. So for example, uh, our current one we roll that we're working with here is the quarry is we have to defeat a chaos army, major victory. For that, we would get, I think I rolled a five for 5,000 gold or something like that. Um, and plus two reputation points. Okay, but let's look at some of the other ones. For example, we also have um, the chaos one up top here. If we had rolled a one on chaos, your reputation goes down by five, which is a huge hunk, um, but you get three D6 times a thousand gold. So what, that would be three, four, eight, 8,000. Of course, it has the possibility to be a heck of a lot more. So it was just a good, interesting idea of like money, reputation, money, reputation. You as the um, fire slayer, you know, rune father, I guess, sort of idea, you are determining what your magma hold is going to take and what their overall reputation is. And I love it. That's so cool. Um, when rolling on the table above to determine the quarry of the new contract, you can add two dice instead of one and pick either result. Uh, let's see. Yeah, okay, here we go. Sorry, I missed a line here. Um, once you've completed those steps, like you get your reward and you're ready to generate the next one, if you wish, you can choose to continue to work for the same paymaster. So if you do so, skip step one when generating the new mercenary contract. In addition, when rolling on the table above to determine the quarry of the new contract, you can roll two dice instead of one and pick either result. Uh, this represents the trust that you have earned from that paymaster. That's terrific. So if you wanted to be a Fire Slayer army that focuses on the more, we'll say dubious sides of the mortal realms, right? They're happy to work for chaos factions and stuff. You can stick with that paymaster. That's totally thematic. It works and I like it quite a bit um chaos stuff it'll never give you more reputation it, the best it can do is zero and not hurt you <laughs> um the death stuff it goes from negative three is the lowest all the way to a plus two so there is a bandwidth there and it looks like destruction the worst it can do is knock you down by one the most it can do is give you a bonus by two so that's huge so order and Man, there's, there's nothing even remotely near that negative five for the chaos. Holy smokes, I like that one a lot. Uh, the effects of reputation. In addition to modifying the role that determines the paymaster of a mercenary contract, your reputation score has the following effects depending on whether it's positive or negative. Okay, positive reputation score. Upon fulfilling a mercenary contract, if you have a positive reputation score and an order paymaster, you can haggle, I love how haggle is bolded like a keyword, like this is a thing, um, haggle over the reward. Alas, there is no use trying to negotiate with a paymaster from other allegiances, that makes sense. If you choose to haggle, roll a dice. On an unmodified roll of a one, the negotiation sour. You still receive the reward, but instead of modifying your reputation score by the amount specified, you must subtract D6 from your score, like the reputation score. Um, any other role will add the reputation score. Let's see, on any other role, add your reputation score to the role and consult the table to see how much gold you receive in addition to the reward. Note that haggling takes place before your reputation score is modified by the amount specified for the contract. Okay, so we can haggle. Let's see. So we have a reputation score. Let's say uh, what we'd roll before. I think it was like a eight. So if we wanted to haggle on our, our contract, you'd roll a four. Uh, so eight plus four would be 12. And we're already locked in. So yeah, um, additional gold. So yeah, we would roll a D6. Five, we would get an extra five grand for that victory, so to speak. So that's an interesting one. Um, you know, but I like that it's there because it gives you a chance to like reach up. I like I like it a lot. Um, if your reputation score is negative 10 or less, any 
exploration rules that correspond to the ancient roads territory are treated as barren wastes instead. In addition, upon fulfilling a mercenary contract in step 7 of the aftermath sequence, if your reputation score is still minus 10 or less after it has been modified by the amount specified for that contract, you must roll a dice for each allied unit on your order of battle. On a 1, that unit deserts you and you must remove it from your order of battle. Furthermore, if your reputation score is negative 10 or less, you cannot add any new allied units to your order of battle. So, I'm going to pause there because the rest of this is stuff that we kind of know. What this allows you to do, in totality, is you become the rune father of your magma hold. You get contracts every single game. You have to kind of weigh the, the differences of... Do I take the contract? Do I not? How does it affect my reputation? After the game, you collect your payment and then you can try to haggle. Now, how much gold you have is a massive power because of those abilities we mentioned before. Instantly getting an artifact of power, that's a whole quest for some armies, or most armies. Um, the territories thing, we'll, we'll check out the territories here in a second. I haven't gone through those specifically, so that might be good, might be bad, whatever. Um, and then the bravery 10 thing is huge. Like there's some fantastic bonuses in this when it comes to the gold, the reputation system is equally a thing that needs to be balanced because if you let it fall apart, if you're all about that gold, your roster is going to suffer. Things start leaving you. You can't take on allies. You know, you're not getting choice territories, a lot of stuff. And so I find that to be very, very interesting. I think it's a cool way to balance, you know, rewards and punishment kind of a deal when it comes to reputation and, and gold or ur gold, whatever it is. Um, I like it personally. I love the fact that they gave you a table for generating your paymaster so that you as a player, you know, we just, we rolled that all out. We had, what was it? Lord Thomas, uh, the merchant prince, Lord Thomas hired me. Let's say I, you know, I totally whipped that destruct, uh, sorry, chaos army. Now I'm at plus two reputation. Yeah, I'm going to work for Thomas again. He's an order guy. He has me going after chaos. That sounds cool. Uh, we want to work for him again. Since we're doing the same paymaster, we can roll two dice. Oh, well, that didn't really help me. Now did it. Let's do this. There we go. <laughs> now we can choose again. Now it's hunting either death or chaos, depending on what's around you. The only limiting factor I see to this is if you're not part of a play group that has a, a wide, diverse um, types of armies. So for example, like locally, we don't really have a destruction player. That's kind of why I picked up bone splitters again. And so we have a lot of order. We have lots of death, almost no destruction. And, uh, there's a couple chaos armies up North, a lot of, a lot of order stuff too, for real. So, uh, you know, and there are other order options in here. So we are hunting order factions. So it's all really cool. I would just ask your opponent, do you mind if I, like, you know, re-roll if it's destruction, if you don't have a destruction player? That kind of stuff, which I think is perfectly reasonable, and I can't see anyone really going after you on it. Because worst case scenario, you're just going to decline the contract, you can't fulfill it, and you have to wait another game. So, like, you just, you just re-roll it. If you wanted to, you can even come up with a better compromise of, like, hey, I'm not trying to game the system, um... I'll just take whatever the crummiest thing in, in this pile is, but I get to choose the quarry. So for example, in the order one, the least meaningful, I guess, outcome you have here is if an order faction hires you to kill another order faction. So that's what that would be. It's D3 times a thousand gold and a minus one reputation. That's it. Like, you know, I mean, it's not ideal, but it lets you keep going kind of a deal is what I'm saying. And so we've established what your magma hold is like, their temperament, who they're willing to work with, what their reputation is, and all of that before we ever set out on an actual quest. And I like that a lot. Uh, we have four quests for the fire slayers. Let's get into them. We have uh, temper the flames. Uh, pick one magma droth unit from your order of battle that does not have a mount trait enhancement. And you pick a mount trait uh, from the offering of Volcatrix table on page 60, which is their just general ones, and write it down. Um, at the end of the Path to Glory battle, complete this quest if that unit destroyed any enemy units, and then you get the uh, mountain trait. So, Magma Droth, 
pick a mountain trait. Does the magma droth kill anything? If yes, you get the mountain trait. Cool. I like when they're simple like that. The next one is find the lost hold. Um, at the end of the Path of Glory battle, roll a dice for each enemy unit in your army. Sorry, for each unit in your army that is wholly within enemy territory. For each six, you discover one clue as to the magma hold's whereabouts. Keep a tally of how many clues you discover. Once you've discovered three or more clues, you can fight Path to Glory battle using the Reclaim the Hold battle plan on page 70. We'll check that out in a second. And if you win a major victory or a minor victory when fighting Reclaim the Hold, you complete this quest. And it has its own rewards built in. So let's go check that out. Interesting battle plan we have here. Um, it uses specifically tunnel fighting, which is an interesting set of side rules that exist in the core book. That's very cool. Um, the Desecrator must split their army into the first contingent and the second contingent. Okay, I understand. Let's see. Okay, sorry about that. I had to take a little quick break and cough there. Um, so you basically have the Reclaimer, which is the Fire Slayers, and your opponent, whoever that is, breaks their army into two contingents, the first and the second. Uh, and those are called the, what are they called? The Desecrator, I believe. The Desecrator, one of their contingents can set up anywhere in this huge middle stretch here. That's all their territory. And the Reclaimer can split their forces. And the idea is you're, you know, tunneling in and, and kind of entrapping your enemy in the magma hole that you just discovered. Uh, from, uh, I think it's the first turn, right? Let's see. At the end of the Desecrator's movement phase, they can set up any of their reserve units, which is the other contingent you didn't pick, within seven inches of the battlefield edge and more than three inches from all enemy units. So they can come in on any edge, but it's you know has to be away from the Fire Slayer unit. That makes perfect sense. In the center, you can see here in the bottom left, apologies for the glare, not a whole lot of ways around it, you have a brazier, the Master Forge in the dead center of the battlefield, and then another brazier right below it. The idea of this game, or of this mission rather, is to relight all three of these things. The hold went dark. So essentially, if you end the turn with a model near a brazier or the Master Forge, you can attempt to light it. Now there are some modifiers to that. Um, let's see, to rekindle a brazier, the Reclaimer rolls a dice, adding one to the roll if there are any Fire Slayer Priests within three inches of the brazier. On a three up, it's rekindled. Perfect, very simple. To rekindle the Master Forge, the Reclaimer rolls a dice, adding one to the roll for each brazier that is rekindled and adding one if there are any Fire Slayer Priests within three inches of the forge. On a five up, the Master Forge is rekindled. At the end of each turn, if the Desecrator controls the Master Forge or any of the braziers, they can extinguish them. So they'll put the fire out, but you have to take and hold these three objectives. That's how you win the mission. Once all three, the two braziers and the Master Forge, are rekindled, boom, that's a glorious victory. So the battle ends if the Master Forge and both braziers are rekindled. Uh, if the Master Forge is rekindled but one or two of the braziers are extinguished, the Reclaimer wins a minor victory. It's all right. If the Master Forge and both braziers are extinguished, the Desecrator wins a major victory. Okay, so on. Um, and then for the rewards for you, uh, you roll a d3 and it kind of tells you right here. So you either earn 2d6 times 1,000 gold. This is for your path to glory, like how much gold your magma hold has. And yeah, and it just kind of just goes through like that. There's just a bunch of different rewards. I think it's pretty cool. So back here on the missions thing, that's a really nice one. Um, you can, the next one here is settle a grudge. You can pick this quest after a battle in which your opponent your opponent won a major victory, make a note of your opponent's name and the faction of their army in your quest log. At the end of the Path of Glory battle, you complete this quest if you won a major victory and your opponent's army was from the same Grand Alliance as the faction written in your quest log. When you complete this quest, if your opponent's army was from the same Grand Alliance as the faction written in your quest log, you earn D6 glory points. If the faction was the same, Oh, like the actual army was the same. You win 2d6 glory points. And uh, if both the faction and your opponent were the same, you earn 3d6. So if you take a loss, record it. Okay. And then for your next quest, if you then beat that same person, meaning the same person with the same army, same Grand Alliance, you roll 3d6 glory points. That's awesome. I like that quite a bit. That is a book of grudges thing right there. 
I, but I love the fact that it does allow room for you to, to have some variation. So like, say I get beat by my buddy Jeremy playing his Soul Blight Grave Lords. If I play, after, after I get beat by him, if I play anyone using a death army, I'll get D6. If I use anyone playing, if, sorry, if I beat anyone playing Soul Blight Grave Lords, I get 2D6. And if I beat Jeremy using those things, I get 3D6. I like that a lot. And the last one here is Slay Bitter Enemies. At the end of a Path of Glory battle, you complete this quest if you won a major victory and your opponent's army was Skaven or Gloomspite Gits. That's... Boom. <laughs> uh, when you complete this quest, each unit in your army that was not destroyed earns one bonus renown point. In addition, if the enemy general was slain by an attack made by your general, your general earns five bonus renown points. <laughs> That's super fun. I like it. Does it... I mean... Does it like matter? Can you game it if you have nothing but Skaven and Gloomsplite players around you? Yeah, you know, I don't care. I love it. I think it's great. Next, we're talking veteran abilities. So these are things that you can earn as your units, you know, persevere through multiple battles. They can get different honors and things like that. Uh, each time a Fire Slayer unit on your Path Glory roster gains a veteran ability, you can pick one from here in addition to those in the core book. The core book ones are great. They're just kind of bland. Let's talk about these. A lot of these seem to be pretty much open to anybody. I don't see a whole lot that are locked behind certain keywords like some factions have. So, Honor Guard. Uh, pick one Fire Slayer's hero from your order of battle. This unit is now that hero's Honor Guard. First of all, pause right there. I love the idea of retinues and making rules for it. It's just awesome. Uh, write this down in the notes column of this unit's entry on your order of battle. This unit can use this veteran ability once per battle when it's picked to shoot or fight, and it's wholly within 9 inches of that hero. Add one to hit rolls and wound rolls for attacks made by this unit until the end of that phase. Uh, if that hero is removed from your order of battle, meaning they die, um, pick another Fire Slayer's hero on your order of battle, and now it's their honor guard. So you don't lose the ability if you lose the hero. They just kind of get reassigned. That's terrific. I love it. I love the honor guard thing. I think it makes perfect sense in Fire Slayers. I'm here for it. Uh, stubborn to the end. This unit can use this veteran ability once per battle when it's the target of an attack. The unit has a ward of a 6-up until the end of that phase. Eh, okay. Okay, it's fine. It's fine. 6-up wards isn't... I mean, I play Bone Splitters. I can assure you it's nothing to brag about. Uh, Rune Etched Fire Steel. This unit can use this veteran ability once per battle when it's picked to shoot or fight. Improve the Ren characteristic of this unit's weapons by 1 until the end of that phase. Another terrific one, if you know where you need to apply pressure and you have a unit that can, you know apply the right amount in terms of rend and damage and that kind of stuff, great. Uh, obviously, when you start stacking this with some of the rend that the units have just on their base war scrolls and stuff, it gets really nasty. Next one is Gilded Throwing Axes. Gilded Throwing Axes. This unit can use this veteran ability once per battle. When it's picked to shoot, add one to the damage characteristic of its fire steel throwing axes until the end of that phase. Now, this one's unique in the sense that it does specifically call out the fire steel throwing axes as the weapon profile that can be modified. That's awesome. You know, let's take a look here. We got fire steel throwing axes, four and four again. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'll take it. That sounds awesome. Um, Relentless Grudge Settlers. This unit can use this veteran ability once per battle when it attempts to charge. Roll 3d6 instead of 2d6 when making the charge roll. Keep in mind you still have to be within 12 inches because this does not modify the range at which you can attempt to charge. All it does is give you an extra die to make a charge that's already legal. So again, it's very different wording from say, uh, what is it like? Kragnos giving you, you know, a longer charge range or whatever. Um, this is its own thing. So cool. Just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, worthy, uh, sorry, worth their weight in Urgold. This unit can use this veteran ability once per battle in your hero phase. When you activate an Urgold rune using the Urgold rune's battle trait, this unit benefits from the enhanced effect of the rune until the start of your next hero phase, regardless of the role that determines whether or not the enhanced effect applies. This is one you will take all the time, <laughs> like all the, all the time. It's really cool. Um, 
just because you're already playing into some of the bonuses that your army already has. So if you already have a plan of attack on how you're going to beat your opponents, this just lets you lean further into that. Because it doesn't require you to do anything different. You don't have to worry about, like, what unit is what? You know, do I have to keep the honor guard close to the hero? All this kind of stuff. Just do what you're going to do. These guys are just going to do it better in general. I like that. And now we come to the territories. Remember, we can spend 20,000 gold from our coffers of our magma hold to ensure that we're rolling on these six. You still have to roll, right? But it just counts the 10 slot as being six, so 60. And then you're rolling for the one. So let's take a look. Is that worth it? Uh, 61, we have Cavern Network. Uh, reduce the glory points cost of adding barracks to your stronghold by one. So barracks allow you to add more units to your roster. That, so if you're looking at possibly, you know, rotating out units quite a bit, you know, dropping them from your roster, adding new ones, that could have a lot of benefit. Uh, you know, it's one of those ones that if it, you don't get it early, I don't think it matters. Like if you've already established your roster and you've already bought barracks and stuff, it doesn't do anything for you. Sorry. Next one is Skaven Warrens. Uh, in step three of the aftermath sequence, you can pick one unit in your order of battle that was not included in your army in that battle to be sent to this territory. If you do so, roll a dice. On a four up, that unit gains one renown point and your reputation score increases by one. However, on a one, that unit must either make an injury roll or have its casualty score increased by one. If you upgrade it for 15, you can send two units instead of one. So this gives you a way to fish for more um, renown points and reputation scores. Which normally I would look at that and go, meh. But because reputation matters so much when it comes to determining the access to contracts that you have. I'm not I'm not mad about this one, to be honest. That's okay. It's, it's neutral. I don't know if I would buy it if I rolled it. But um, I could see it. I could see it. Uh, next one is Gold Deposit, which is very simple. In uh, Step 7 of the Aftermath Sequence, you receive D6 times 100 gold. And that's going to be an every game thing because you have the property. And so that's awesome. If you upgrade it to a gold mine, you get 2D6 times 100. Not 1,000. 2D6 times 100. Uh, and I, I... Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Get five of these if you can in terms of the territories that your stronghold can can have uh i like that quite a bit because it plays into all the things they're already doing you know if you have what i mean honestly the way that i look at it is it's just making up for you it's like a um what do you call it? a cash pack coupon when you like use the ability to give your guys a bravery 10 that all costs it's 100 gold times the number of units that you brought to battle so this just helps you recoup some of that money. Cool. We have the Magma Droth Fire Nest. Oh, this is a long one. Okay, so this territory cannot be upgraded. Good good start, I guess. Uh, this territory, sorry, in Step 7 of the Aftermath Sequence, you can pick one Auric Rune Father, Auric Rune Son, or Auric Rune Smiter on your order of battle to be sent to this territory. If you do so, roll a dice. On a 4-up, that hero tames the Magma Droth. When a hero tames the Magma Droth, first increase your monster limit on your order of battle by one. Then, pick a heroic upgrade for that hero that replaces its War Scroll with one that the Magma Droth, oh, that has the Magma Droth keyword. When picking a heroic upgrade in this way, you do not spend any glory points and the hero does not need the required renown points. Otherwise, follow all the rules and restrictions of the heroic upgrade as normal. Finally, remove this territory from your roster. So if you earn this, you have a chance. Well, you, yeah, like, let's see, finally. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, this if you earn this one, you get a chance to get a free upgrade onto a Magma Droth, which is a really cool thing. Not necessarily something everybody wants, but it's a cool thematic one for sure. And then once you achieve that Magma Droth, it goes away. Lake of Magma, uh, let's see, you can never have more than one territory of this type. This territory has no effect until it's upgraded. Already don't like it, but humor me. Upgrade it for 30 glory points. Oh. Magma Aqueduct, in the middle of, sorry, in middle and higher tier battles, meaning if I'm playing someone who's equal to or 
higher than me in terms of how developed their army is on the path to glory thing. Add one to chanting rolls for friendly fire slayers attempting to summon an invocation. I I don't know how I feel about that one. Like it's a good power. Um I don't hmm. I don't know if I like straight buffs like that. I like the other ones that kind of play with the Path to Glory system, like giving you gold or reputation or that kind of stuff, but just a straight chanting roll, like army-wide buff, like you're increasing an allegiance ability. I'm not sure if I really care for that, but uh, it's good. It's effective. (laughs) How about that? And then Shard of Grimnir. Uh, You can't have more than one territory, and it does nothing until it's upgraded, and its upgraded cost is 45 glory points, which is... Uh, insane. I mean, that's, that's an absolutely insane amount of, because you could basically build an entire fortress for that. Statue of Grimnir. In a middle tier battle, when you're playing against someone equally opposed, when you activate an Urgold rune using Urgold rune's battle trait, the enhanced effect applies on a 5 up instead of a 6. On a high tier battle, meaning you are fighting someone who's greater than you, the enhanced effect applies on a 4 up instead of a 6. Again, I don't like these. Um, I don't like them because they, first of all, nothing happens when you roll it. You have to sink a whole bunch of glory points into that. And none of the gold and, and reputation stuff helps cover the cost of some of the things. So, for example, like the Ossiarch Bone Reapers have a thing where they have their own currency mechanic and it can be used as glory points on a one-to-one you know, exchange basis. They don't have anything like that. So glory points are still very, very important. Um, and these are just huge sinks of them. I mean, huge, huge, huge. And what you get is stuff that just, it just feels like a case of like the rich get richer. If you have 45 glory points, you know what you don't need? (laughs) Superpowers on a five up every single time. Like, you know what I mean? Like you're a great little saver. Keep going. You know what's going on? Uh, it's just going to steamroll stuff. So these two, I look at with very dubious eyes, but the rest of them I actually very much like. And then over here we have the heroic upgrades. Very simply put, this is how you can upgrade a war scroll into another one. So for example, if you have a rune sun, this is how you get a rune sun and a magma droth. And so they have to have so many renown points and it costs so many glory points to add the magma droth to their roster. And at this point you would delete their section from your roster of battle and re-add them, you know, like with the magma droth war scroll. It's very simple. Um, I like the fact that this is always here and there is a territory that lets you kind of hop, skip, and jump past that, but it's cool that it exists. And just revisiting one last time, you're of course your Magma Hold roster. Um, you have spaces for your Magma Hold's name, the Rune Father's name, your favorite Rune Son. So if there's one particular one in your roster that you're like, that's my boy, you can put him here. Um, and then of course has spaces for your Paymaster, the Quarry, the Reward section. And this obviously can change game to game because you can always get a new paymaster. Or if you win, you can keep rolling it forward and keep working for them. So that would not do much. Reputation score. Treasury. How much the actual gold you actually have in there at this moment. And uh, this just requires, uh, sorry, gives you a way to record the epic deed. So how many contracts have you fulfilled? Uh, contracts fulfilled with the current paymaster. Mercenary contracts successfully haggled. Nice little scorekeeper there. Expeditions funded. So expeditions, like we said before, is ways to go out and uh, do better terrain rolls, that kind of thing. Artifacts forged and goose fests held. I love it. And of course, if you want to, on the right side, you have War Scroll Battalions. These are the more narrative ones. Um, not going to go into them too much, but they, they make for great like fodder to start building your Magma Hold roster with. So let's take a step backwards and just kind of just do a very, very, very brief you know, overview of how I feel about this. I love it. This is my favorite Path of Glory system so far because it puts you in the driver's seat of your magma hold and makes every battle a part of a larger story. But it's just, it's so perfect for the Fire Slayers. I love the gold management aspect, the things you can do with it, the generator for your contract person. That's so awesome. This is the coolest thing ever. It makes me legitimately want a Fire Slayer army. This section of the book gets me hyped uh the only things that i'm not stoked about are these territories that have just massive game you know uh changing effects like these are allegiance ability like 
you know, getting plus one to your prayer rolls, that's like a sub faction level thing. And if you already have a sub faction, it, it just it's just a lot. I feel like for the narrative mission stuff, it's like the rich getting richer. Like I said earlier, so these two, I'm, they're good. I would never fault anyone for taking them and wanting to use them. It's just, it's I would just say no personally. Um, but everything else I'm, I'm here for. I'm here for the mission where you're trying to take back a magma hold. Oh my God, are you kidding me? Yes. Um, all these things. I just think it's the coolest stinking army, uh, in terms of how you can bring its lore to life. So I'm, I'm super jazzed. I, I'm not going to commit to, uh, fire slayers as an army, but my God, this is a, this is a really good indication of what could be. So anyway, friends, I hope you enjoyed that review. If you have any thoughts or concerns, questions about it, leave in the comments down below. I'll be happy to answer you then. Thank you so much for watching and hanging out with me. I'll catch you next time. Happy Wargaming.